But we ended uh, last week's sermon talking about the sovereignty of God. And we talked about God's sovereignty being displayed in different ways. The sovereignty of God displayed in creation. The sovereignty of God displayed in the cross. And we talked very briefly about the sovereignty of God displayed in salvation. Which really, as we are going to be going through the doctrines of grace, that's the aim here for the next few weeks, five weeks, right? I know you know that. But the next several sermons as we contemplate the doctrines of grace, it is this idea of the total sovereignty of God over all of salvation that we are contemplating. But it begins with at least thinking about salvation as we did with the sovereignty of God and then nextly and closely related to that is the concept of what has been called historically the doctrine of total depravity. The total depravity of man. Let me just kind of segue into that by saying that I've been thinking about the total depravity of man it seems like more lately because recently the inception of Red Grace Media, my online ministry that I've been doing, uh, Robert Reese and I, that we've been doing, has just been pushing me more towards thinking about culture, thinking about how evangelism and apologetics and those types of things, but considering the intersection between Christ and culture, how those things intersect, but also how they conflict. But in doing that, because it requires time and research and reading and, and thinking about cultural trends and the cultural milieu that we are literally in, I'm finding that we are entering into an increasingly dark time in our culture. John Calvin is famous for that dictum, that old saying that he used to say, post tenebras lux, which was basically Latin for after darkness, light. After darkness, light. In other words, for John Calvin, the dawn of the Reformation was the dawn of a new day. It was the dawn of the Word of God coming out, bringing the, the sunlight of the glory of God and of the truth of the Word of God out of Roman Catholic darkness. I love history. And if you would ever become a student of history, then you will know that shortly after the first few centuries of the Christian church after Christ, the church as a whole entered into what, was, what is historically called the Dark Ages. Why is it called the Dark Ages? Was the sun just not as bright back then? No. The Word of God was not as bright back then. In the sense that the Roman Catholic Church through the invention of the priesthood, through the invention of the mass, through the invention of all of their extra-biblical doctrines had literally chained the Word of God to Catholic monasteries, making it inaccessible for the common man. Inaccessible for the common man. So that Luther said that the Reformation was the the, the light that came after that dark period when the Word of God was finally unchained into society again, where the common man could pick up the Bible like any priest in the Catholic Church and could read it for himself and come to his own conclusions. And it was truly a time when light began to dawn. But I am seeing more and more that the the sun of the Reformation is now beginning to set in a very dark and dismal postmodern world and what can only be described as postmodern madness. It seems like every day more light switches are being turned off. It seems like more every day some evangelical, quote unquote, evangelical pastor is coming out in support of gay marriage. Seems like more and more every single day, the madness that is Islam is 
prevailing all over the world. I mean, it's safe for us here in America, but transport you into the, into the, the Muslim world and trust me, you to think that you're living in some pretty dark times. I mean, just in recent times, ISIS, which stands for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, a rebel Al-Qaeda offshoot, has all but toppled the entire country of Iraq. As I mentioned last time and this week, I had the unfortunate, the unfortunate privilege of watching an execution. Well, they, even the media blocked out some of the more grotesque scenes, but public executions with little children walking around in a, in a town square with, in the middle of, oh, I don't know, 5,000 people with little children walking around waving the black flag of Al-Qaeda and of the Muslim Brotherhood and of all the other militant Islamic groups, while two men are brought out to the middle of the, of the, of the town square and shot execution style and then strung up and hung on a wooden stake for all to mock. Little children are walking around watching this, singing in Arabic. I mean, this is the world that we're living in. And what is the church doing right about now? John Piper, in a recent sermon that he did for the gospel, uh, together for the gospel, said that pastors are being inc more and more in, uh, uh, urged to lighten up in their message in the pulpit, to get funny. In the face of Islam, that Islam, while Islam is advancing, the church is, spy is increasingly looking more like Disneyland than the church. And so what it means is that the church really doesn't take the doctrine of total depravity very serious. That what the Bible teaches about the heart of man, as Jesus says, out of the heart comes evil. <laughs> I mean, if that is not a sober call to the church to wake up, and to shake off any semblance of psychological, psychobabble, humanistic thought that teaches that man is the measure of all things. That man has all of the resources and all of the powers within himself to reform himself, to strengthen himself, to better himself. Which is just absolute insanity in the light of what Jesus' counsel is. Jesus' his counsel says, out of the heart come evil, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slander, a total indictment on the human condition. But, the human, but humans insist we are basically good people. You go online, you jump on the Humanist Manifesto that you can read for free online, and you will see what the psychological opinion of the culture is. That man is basically good. That man is the measure of all things. That man is not in need of any spirits or gods or deities or genies or, or, or angels or demons or anything like that. Humanism is the biggest problem of any culture any culture. When man thinks that man is the measure of all things, then nothing, nothing is outside of what he is capable of doing. And the doctrine of total depravity agrees with that. And what is the answer for total depravity? The answer for total depravity, my friends, is total sovereignty. That's the only answer. Only total sovereignty can overcome and overpower the power of sin and sin's cruel bondage. The issue of depravity has to do with the issue of the heart. And I'm not talking about the human organ. I'm talking about his sin nature, his sin condition, his sinful heart that Jesus was talking about, that Calvin says, out of the heart... Or the heart is an idle factory, rather. And that factory never stops working. The idle producing factory of the heart of man never stops producing 
False doctrines, false gods, false wisdom, false spirituality, false ideas, false opinions, devoid of the fear of the Lord and therefore devoid of wisdom. Now, it is a bleak and dismal condition that the human race is in, and the race is in that condition because of Adamic sin. In Adam, as Scripture teaches us, all men die. In Adam, all are guilty. And so, Adam being the first Adam, being our representative head, represented all of humanity when he plunged us into a sinful condition. We inherited his sin. We inherited his guilt. We inherited his death sentence. We inherited his corruption. All of these things are symptoms of total depravity. But what is at the root of it all? What is at the root of it all in our own lives is our heart. Man is born with a sin nature, and it renders him spiritually dead so that God must act sovereignly to overthrow our sinful nature, to bring life where there is only death to bring fellowship where there is only alienation from God, to bring friendship where there is only hostility, to bring light when there is only darkness. In order to understand that, therefore, I want to point out three things about the heart of man. Number one, the heart of man is radically depraved. The heart of man is radically depraved. Now, historically speaking, Historically speaking, we need to understand something about the five points of Calvinism because that's what they came to be called. Understand that the five points of Calvinism began not as a positive presentation on the side of the reformers, but as a response to another group, namely those who were known as the remonstrants. The remonstrants were those that followed the teachings of, 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 of uh, James Arminius and, or Jacob Arminius, however you want to pronounce that name. Um, there's kind of a debate on that. But Arminians follow Arminius, and when the Reformation took place, the, the followers of Arminius said, these things we disagree with the Reformation. And those things had to do with the nature of the will. Those things had to do with the, the nature of depravity. They had to do with the nature of election. They had to do with the extent of the atonement. They had to do with the concept of losing your salvation so that the, the reformers then responded in a defense of their positions on those particular issues and which came to be known as the five points of Calvinism. Now, for some of you that don't know what Calvinism is, it doesn't mean it follows John Calvin. It doesn't mean you are followers of John Calvin. If you went up to John Calvin early on in his life and you said, hey, I believe in the five points of John Calvin, <laughs> he would look at you like, what are you talking about? <laughs> You see, John Calvin did not sit down and write down the fi- and wrote down the five points of Calvinism. In other words, these were just these were deductions that were made on the basis of the theology of John Calvin. It staggers me how Arminians just write off John Calvin. Oh, <laughs> John Calvin, he just, you know, he's, he made some awful statements about so and so. And in doing so, they write off one of the greatest minds that has ever that, 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 that we ever had in the Christian church. John Calvin's just amazing, amazing. You read the Institutes. He wrote those in his early 20s. Boy, what God did in John Calvin. You read the Westminster Confession of Faith, the London Baptist Confession of Faith. You read the early Confession. They all go back to John Calvin. The Synod of Dort goes back to John Calvin. The Westminster Assembly goes back to the teachings of Calvin. There's no question about it. And I just say that to say we need to be historically honest in theology. Give credit where credit is due. And don't be so prideful. I hope a lot of Arminians listen to this message. I'm sure I'll get some emails, but that's okay. But the doctrine of total depravity, let's get this straight. When it came to be formulated, the, the, the reformers were very careful to say that when they said total depravity, they did not mean utter depravity, which means they were not saying that man is as sinful as he could possibly be so that 
An unbeliever is incapable of doing anything good for you or doing anything good or getting, being obedient to the laws of the land or performing brain surgery on you so that you can live. No, an unbeliever can do you great good. There's no question about that. It's not that he's just nonstop around the clock going around doing as much evil as he is capable of doing. That's not what total depravity means. It's more along the lines of radical depravity. Radical means reaching every area, every sphere, going to every corner of the person of or the humanness of man. Anthropologically, in other words, it affects every aspect of man, both the physical and the metaphysical. Both the visible and the invisible aspects of our humanness are affected by sin. So let's begin with the physical aspect of man, namely our body. Our body is subject to depravity, to sin. You know that if you woke up this morning and if you had any aches and pains whatsoever, that means you're probably older than 20. But if you're in your 30s or 40s or older, then you know your body has been subject to depravity. It is feeling the effects of depravity. But it goes back to birth, right? David said in Psalm 51, in sin I was conceived. From the very beginning, we begin to die. From the very beginning, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, we are handed a, a death sentence. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, we are, the outer man is perishing, wasting away. We're on a timer. And immediately we feel the reign of death. We feel the tyranny of death within ourselves. From here... We know that our bodies are fallen, our bodies are driven by sinful passions and sinful impulses. The human, the, the human body uh, can either be used for things that are good and right, or they can be used for things that are outright evil. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, there's a couple verses that I want to highlight there for you, but Romans chapter 6 just shows how that human depravity is lived out by what we do with the members of our bodies. Romans 6.12. Therefore, Romans 6.12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. And your members, that's uh, referring to your body parts, as instruments of righteousness to God. In other words, there's only two ways to live in the body, Paul is saying, either to sin or to God, verse 13. But in verse 16, he goes on to talk about the corporeal aspect of depravity, the body which was born in iniquity. It can either be a vessel of righteousness or a vessel of iniquity. And he says, do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. I remember this early on as a Christian. I went to a friend's house. Matter of fact, I went to a lot of friends' house, and I told them I'm a Christian now. Went to all my close friends' houses, and I told them I am a Christian now. Don't call me tonight. I won't go party with you. And I was trying to explain this very principle to one of my friends, Johnny. And I said, Johnny, you're a slave of sin. He says, no, I'm not a slave of anybody. I said, oh, I challenge you. Stop cussing for the next five minutes. And the first word out of his mouth was a cuss word. <laughs> some expletive, some expression of indignation that I dared to challenge him. And of course, he failed the test in about two seconds. But man is a slave of sin because he presents his members to sin, to obey the principle of sin, to obey unrighteousness, to obey those impulses. It is in the body, according to Scripture, that we commit immorality of every kind. Adultery, sexual impurity of every kind. It defiles the body. It, according to Paul, you are sinning against your physical body by engaging in sexual sin. 
in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. 619, we are told that the body is a temple for the spirit, or we could also harbor iniquity in our bodies. We can also live out the sinful passions of our flesh in our body. This is why God has to redeem our fallen bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a very important uh, verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, because the body that we possess now is perishable for that very reason, because it is sinful, it is mortal, it will die because of the principle of sin. And therefore, God must rescue it. He must redeem it. And he says there in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this perishable, that is your body, must put on imperishable, And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about that saying that is written, death is swallowed up by victory. This body is destined to experience the the defeat of death, the sting of death, the curse of death. And if you would ever overcome death you would have to trust in the one who can redeem you and overcome and take away the sting and the victory of death you know it was a common heresy in the new testament to have a low view of the body which just led to more sin in the body the gnostics the docetists early ascetics all had a very low view of the human body The Gnostics viewed the body mainly as evil, as you know. Material, that which is material was worthless. That which was material was unimportant. And the only thing that was important was the metaphysical aspect of man, that principle that went back to the spiritual realm. The body, in essence, was worthless. So Gnostics ended up degrading their body. They ended up uh, giving themselves to all sorts of ungodly and immoral practices because as far as they're concerned, what you do with your body is not important. But we know the body is important, that we are created in the image of God. That because we're in the image of God, God cares what you do with your physical body. That we not continue to present our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness. What is going on right now in Western culture with this tsunami of homosexuality is essentially a sin against the body. It is a wrong view of the body, it is a mistreatment of the body, it is a degrading of the body, a lowering of what God has designed for the human body. Now, let's look at some of the metaphysical aspects of man. The fact that radical depravity, uh, the fact of radical depravity means that man is depraved in every aspect, every facet, every area of man's humanity is infected and is ruined by sin. The metaphysical aspect of man is also ruined. And here I'm referring mainly to the, to the mind and to the emotions so that we could say the mind is where the soul thinks and the heart is where the soul feels. And both of these are non-corporeal, non-physical aspects of man and both are affected by sin. Let's start with the mind. Theologians like to talk about the noetic effects of sin. Noetic simply comes from the Greek word naos, which speaks of the mind. And so what effect did sin have on the mind? Well, according to Scripture, it had a very dire effect on the mind. And with the mind, you think of what the mind does, what it is capable of doing. The mind is capable of thinking about the two highest possible concepts in the universe. Namely, himself, man, and God. And both of those things are ruined through sin. So that man cannot think rightly about himself or about God. And is in need of redemption in his mind. That's why it says that our conscience, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 9, our conscience is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Both of these are fundamental issues that man simply can't think right about. That's why you can have a whole panel 
of experts in their fields of psychology, spirituality. I was just watching. You ever watch those old, uh, you ever watch those old uh, John MacArthur clips on Larry King? Oh, those things are so great. It's amazing. John MacArthur is like the only person on television who can speak rightly about the Christian faith. It's just unbelievable. They can't ever get a right representative, except for Johnny Mac. Even now, you know, Larry King retired. I haven't seen John MacArthur back on television. But they always bring some liberal from every field, some psychologist, some spiritist, and none of them are ever capable of giving you sound, straightforward answers to some of the most basic things of life. They are totally inconsistent, totally irrational. You know, Jeremiah talked about the noetic effects of sin a long time ago. In Jeremiah chapter 10, he talks about the wisdom of the nations, the wise men of the pagan nations, and he says that they are altogether stupid and foolish. They're delusional because of their idolatry. And he says in chapter 10, verse 14, every single man is stupid and devoid of knowledge. That is an oracle of Yahweh. This is Yahweh's assessment of the noetic effects of sin. Men are in a stupor because of sin, mental stupor. They are devoid of true knowledge. That is really what we get from looking at total depravity. Hopefully, we gain a greater appreciation for sin's misery, sin's destructive nature, sin's ruinous rampage on earth, in the world. And it affects every person, no matter how smart. It doesn't matter how high your IQ is. If you are a human being, that means you are born in Adam, and that means you have Adamic sin in your soul, in your system, keeping you from thinking rightly. Turn to Romans chapter 1, because Romans 1, possibly the best place that we can go to talk about the noetic effects of sin, In Romans chapter 1, we also, consequently, we also have a a context where we see the interchangeable nature of the terms mind and heart and those types of things because I am a dichotomist. I don't believe in trichotomy. I I, I believe man is body and soul, but I don't think man is body, soul, and spirit as if spirit and soul are different. They're not. They're interchangeable from everything I can see from the data of Scripture. But Romans chapter 1, verse 18, begin, the, the, the noetic effect of sin begins there. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They are suppressing a metaphysical property, a metaphysical entity, namely truth, propositional ideas, propositional things, words, logical syllogisms, uh, uh, literary constructs. They are suppressing the truth with what? With their mind. Jump down to verse 21. Even though they knew God, so that man still in his depraved mind has a knowledge of God, but again, not rightly, it says, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. Now, here's the, here's the interchangeable use of the term. And their foolish heart was darkened. So speculation, sphere of the mind, their foolish heart is darkened. I think those are appositional statements. They are e- equated here, equivocated as the same thing. Look at down to uh, verse 28. Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, so that at some point because man loves his sin and does not want the truth, he gets to the point where the, even the knowledge of God is just intolerable. God gave them over to what? A depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. I tell you what. With what we're facing right now in America, Romans chapter 1 is a chapter that you all better have down. Don't take it for granted. Oh, I've heard the suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Memorize it. Know it. Do a vocabulary study. Know the context. Exegete Romans chapter 1. You're going to need it at work. You're going to need it at school. You're going to need it in your family. 
You're going to need it in this culture. You're going to need it in the church. You're going to need it when you talk to other professing Christians like I did this week, talking to a young man who was arguing for gay Christianity. Some of you maybe heard the podcast. I was able to contact the Bible study leader in that video that we played. And, um, well, he contacted me. He wanted to talk to me. said he was very upset with me. I said, fine. We had a pretty, pretty cordial conversation for about an hour and a half. Very confused young man. Totally bought into the liberal hermeneutic of Scripture. And um, is in great compromise, and I fear for his soul. But uh, let's look at some more of the inward effects of sin. Yes, there is the mind, but there is more than that. There is not just the mind, but every aspect of the inwardness of man, his emotions, his motives, his ambitions, his volitional powers, all of that is affected by sin. It's important to note that the heart is totally depraved, and regardless of what inward aspect we're talking about, whether we're talking about his emotions, Romans chapter 1, verse 29, or his thoughts, as Jesus says, Mark 7, 21, his ambitions, under sin's dominion and sin's tyranny, all of these aspects are corrupted. As Jesus said, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man, these inner aspects of man. Now, let me move from there, and let me move to another aspect of total depravity that's very important, and that is not only is man's heart radically depraved, but man's heart is also religiously impotent, religiously impotent. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Again, the metaphysical, non-corporeal aspect of man, non-physical consists of a religious uh, consists of the lack of a truly religious life and there i'm using the word religion like the puritans not afraid of the word religion if it's in the true and living god this moves us to what we can call the religious impotence of man total depravity has often been thought of as a common ground between calvinists and arminians you would often hear arminian uh, arminians say that man is sinful and that we agree. Calvinists and Arminians agree man is a sinner. But what usually comes to a head is the, the idea of inability, that man is religiously impotent, that man cannot do anything to better himself religiously. He cannot go to AA he cannot begin to adopt spirituality in his life. He cannot take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and come out with his own religious concoction. No, man is not able to reform himself. This is what is known as self-salvation, autosoterism, self-salvation. Listen, folks, if man can reform himself, then why in the world did Jesus have to die? If man is able to pull himself up by his own moral bootstraps and reform his thinking, reform his habits, reform his, his lifestyle on his own, then I would submit to you that Jesus died in vain. That's why G Paul says he does not set aside the grace of God or else Jesus did die in vain. But perhaps no one text explains to us this idea of the religious impotence of man than Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. You were dead in trespasses and sins. That is an emphatic, that is a comprehensive, that is an exhaustive statement on the condition of man. Dead. And what more needs to be said about someone who is dead? It's dead. There's nothing else to say. He's not twitching. Uh, you know, he, he's not just, uh, uh, he's, he's not a zombie that's just going to come to life on his own. I mean, he is dead, dead in sin. He says, you in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, of the spirit that is now work in the sons of disobedience, 
among whom among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest was a child of wrath you've rattled off that verse time and time again the child of wrath but what does that mean it literally means that it literally speaks of someone being reserved for wrath that is your sole purpose as a child of wrath, to be reserved for wrath. Now, according to this verse, when we walk around society at the store, at school, at work, within the family, when we turn on the television or look at the internet, we ought to see dead people all around us. Spiritually, dead people. Total depravity, in other words, means that people who are unregenerate are somewhat in a zombie-like state. They are animated, they are walking around, but they are really lifeless. They don't have true life. They don't have spiritual life. They don't have abundant life. They don't have eternal life. This is why the children of, children of wrath are driven around, almost like a puppet show. Satan, according to Timothy, Paul says in, in first, Second Timothy, that they are held captive by him to do his will. He is the puppet master, and he pushes them around according to the course of this world, that is, according to the principles, philosophies, ethics, and standards of this fallen world. They are driven around by that. They're driven around by moralism. They're driven around by religious pluralism. They're driven around by postmodernism. They are driven around by existentialism. They're driven around by humanistic principles. We can go on and on and on. A religiously impotent person has no access to God. This is the doctrine of total depravity at its worst. The worst part of total depravity is not that people are capable of doing wicked things. The, prob the worst aspect of total depravity is that people are emphatically and indefinitely separated from God. That's the worst part. You are cut off. As Paul says, you are strangers. You're hostile. You're set apart from God. You're alienated. And also, therefore, theologically, when we speak of a spiritually dead person, we are also speaking of a spiritually hostile person. It's not just they're dead and they have no effect. They are dead but in their deadness, they are hostile to God. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It says in verse 6, verse 6, the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not subject itself to the law of God for it is not even able to, to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now there is a double negation there. Not even able, cannot please. This is Paul's way of emphasizing the inability, the religious impotence of man. He emphasizes that sinners cannot do not even one right thing in God's eyes that would commend them to God. Not one religious thing Thing is even possible for an unregenerate person. And this runs right in the face of everything that you're going to hear in society. Everything that you hear coming from this cultural Christianity, this moralistic type Christianity, this what Michael Horton called moralistic therapeutic deism. I think that's right. We want morality, we want some sort of spiritual therapy, and, but we want deism at the end of the day. We don't want the God who is really involved in our lives. And so this speaks to the impotence of man again. And because man is dead in trespasses and sins, because he is not able to subject himself to the law of God, because he is not able to please God, it means he cannot pray. An unregenerate person who has no salvation cannot pray to God. 
He cannot obey God's commands. He cannot fellowship with God's people because there is no spiritual fellowship until there is spiritual salvation. He cannot love God. He cannot fear God. He cannot repent to God. He cannot believe in God. And he cannot approach God. Exodus 33, 20. In other words, sinners who do not have a true religious life, true genuine salvation, have no access to the presence of God. They cannot commune with God. They cannot commune with God. Before even approaching God, he must be enabled. Turn to John chapter 6. Many of you knew that I was going there. John chapter 6. In other words, in order for a sinner to go from a place of sin to salvation, he first must be enabled by God, quickened. And this is going to spill into my last point. But John 6 verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now that's important. Stop there. Some definitions are in order. What does Jesus mean? No one can come to me. Well, the word come is indicative of faith. That's what it's talking about. To approach Christ by faith. Not simply to draw near to him spatially, but to draw near to him spiritually. That is what Jesus is talking about. He cannot do that unless the Father draws him, pulls him in, draws him by his Spirit. How does God do that? i tell you how he does that. He does that by his Spirit, and he does that by his gospel, by his Word. He regenerates us by his Word, but I'm getting ahead of myself because I don't want to get there yet. The person who wants to come must first be drawn doesn't even want to come. He must be enabled to desire even one spiritual thing. And the person who truly comes to Christ, it is he that will be raised up on the last day. That is, raised up in a positive way, not in a pejorative way, in a positive sense, in a, in a sacramental sense, in a sense that you will be given grace by being raised up. You will be raised up on the last day, which is a glorious, glorious promise for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. But apart from faith in Jesus Christ, you will not be raised up on the last day in a good sense. You will be raised up, but you will be raised up for judgment and condemnation. Look at verse 45. It explains a little bit more of this drawing. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Amazing. Amazing what John is doing there. John is essentially talking about the nature of God drawing people. That internal witness of what they hear in verse 45. And, in fact, he is quoting, he's referring back to Isaiah 54 where, where this word is uttered, that they shall be taught of God. And what is God teaching you? Well, in other words, he is imparting to you truth. He is imparting to you the gospel. He is teaching your soul the truth of Christ. Amazing how Jesus attributes this work to himself and in relationship to himself. What all this leads to is my last point. Not only is man radically depraved, not only is the heart of man religiously impotent, as we've seen, but the heart of man is also regenerated spiritually. That just reinforces the idea that man cannot reform himself. There is not enough good works that a billion good works could not reform the heart of man, the life of man. The life of man can only be reformed by the Spirit of God. If, you're, if you remember our, our, our passage there in Ephesians, go back to it, Ephesians 2. Because 
It's so comprehensive. Not only are we giving an you know, uh, explanation of sin, a, a theology of depravity, not only are we given a glimpse into the deadness of man, the religious impotence of man, but also, and in addition to that, we also see the regenerative work of God making us alive, as it says. Paul says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love which he, uh, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it does no good to say, let me get in a right place first, and then I'll get right with God. You can't get yourself in a good place first. You can't, well, let me get in the swing of things. Let me start going to church, reading my Bible, hanging out with Christian people. Then, then I'll get serious about God. Then I'll submit my life to Jesus Christ. No, no. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He came for sinners who acknowledge their bankrupt nature. He came for the poor in spirit, those who would beat on their breast and say, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Which means they are willing to identify their specific sin and not just give some general glib sort of description of, well, everyone's a sinner. <laughs> well, thank you for educating God on that point. But he wants to know that you understand that you are a sinner and that you, your sin is perceived in the right light, that it is ruinous, that it is destructive, that it is evil, that it is against God. Even when we were dead, in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. No wonder, he says, by grace you have been saved. It is all of grace. Life is all of grace. To know Jesus is all of grace. It is none of yourself. Regeneration is purely a sovereign work of God, and that's why I started with the sovereignty of God first. Because what we're saying with the doctrines of grace, what total depravity is saying is God must act. Or those people in Denton that the guys were preaching to last night, they will never change. They will never leave their postmodernism. They will never leave their sinful lifestyle. Unless God acts, that's why we pray to God and we don't pray to man. We, we acknowledge in prayer, evangelistic prayer, do you pray evangelistically? Paul did. And he ordered men, men, pray. Pray for your presidents. Pray for your kings, your rulers. Pray for those in authority. Pray that God saves them. Pray. Lift up holy hands. Don't doubt. No wrath. Don't question it. Worship God. Pray to God. He's able to deliver. That's a prayer of faith. That's evangelistic prayer. It's the type of prayer that acknowledges only God can save. Jonah 2.9, salvation is of the Lord. And so God must regenerate man spiritually. He cannot be regenerated through anything else. Nothing can save him, save the Spirit of God himself. Titus chapter 3 verse 5, a crucial, critical text if you are tempted to depend and to put trust and to rely on your own good deeds, your own works. Titus 3.5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. It's not to say I've done righteous things. So classic. I'm so grateful for a passage like this. Aren't you? That you could take this verse and show so many people that are trusting in their own good works and show them, look, not even your righteous deeds will commend you to God. It says, but it was according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration, the renewing by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, totally sovereign, totally free to regenerate whomever he wills. And what, um, what we need to do now is let's end on a bright point. The doctrine of total depravity is dark and dismal. It's depressing. It's saddening because we're talking about the depth of sin, the ruin of sin, the misery of sin. 
But to end on a bright note, the doctrine of total depravity should cause us to look in only one direction, Christ. In Christ, all curse is gone. All death is life. All blindness is sight. All impotence is now power in the spirit. All alienation is now friendship. All enmity is now amity. All hell is now heaven. Only in Christ. What do you point people to when you want them to be Christians? Don't point them to church. Don't point them to your Bible study. Don't point them to prayer. Don't point them to the television. Point them to Christ. Say to them, flee to Christ. Go to Christ. Run to Christ. Thrust yourself at the mercy of Christ. Abandon yourself to Christ. Unidentify with everyone else around you and identify solely with Christ. He will give you a home. He will give you life. He will give you hope. He will give you eternal life. Go to Christ. You know what else is bright and beautiful about the doctrine of total depravity? Not only does it mean that we look only to Christ, away from ourselves, but also this. The doctrine of total depravity also teaches us that you and I have no ground for boasting at all. We cannot boast in anything of ourselves, our upbringing. I remember one time preaching on the open air. I was standing open air preaching, and a man walked by and yelled out, my son is a minister. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. I think what he was doing was justifying himself. Like the parable of the foolish virgins, I think he was thinking, I will borrow his faith. My son's a minister. Surely God will be good to me. Surely that has to mean something to the Almighty. It means nothing other than the fact that that is just greater condemnation coming your way. Because your son is a minister, sir, you are of greater accountability to God. And so we cannot boast in anything. Our upbringing, our family, our heritage, our race, our ethnicity, our gender, nothing. 1 Corinthians, go there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's not that we don't boast at all. Don't get me wrong. We should be boasters. We need to be boastful people. But we boast in the right thing. 1 Corinthians 1.28. 1.28. 1, right after the Apostle Paul says, Look, God has chosen the foolish things of this world. He's chosen the weak things of this world. He says the base things of the world, the despised, that is what God has chosen. Isn't that amazing? And he says, he says here, so that, or rather verse 20, uh, 30, but, no, 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 where am I at? Verse 28, the base things of the world, the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, that he would nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By his doing means by God's power, his enablement, his, his sovereignty, who became to us, you say, well, now that I'm in Christ, then I'll take it from there. No, you won't. Christ is our wisdom. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our redemption. So that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. What does the doctrine of total depravity teach us? That we ought to boast solely in the Lord. I'll leave you with this verse, brothers and sisters. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom or through which 
the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we know that we live in a, a world that is under the sway of the evil one and total depravity is everywhere. And we acknowledge that just as much as there is evil around us, we confess, O oh God, there is evil in us. And so, Lord, work out of us the remaining effects of sin. Sanctify us, Lord, through Christ. Sanctify us, as the verse says, Lord, that Jesus has become for us sanctification. Lord, let it be that all of our sanctification is in the Son. As we obey His commands, as we love Him, purify us. Oh God, as dismal and dark and as, as depressing as the doctrine of total depravity is, at the same time, Lord, we rejoice that You are able to bring us out of our misery. And so, Father, for every person here and for any person here who is not in Christ, I pray they hear hope only in one place, only in one person, in Jesus, your Son, and in His cross, so that one day, one day they too can say, the world has been crucified to me, and I have been crucified to the world. Father, we are so helpless without you. Lord, we are totally dependent upon you. We need you, God, to act and to move Move on the heart of sinners. Move on the heart of those that come under the preaching of the gospel, that come under the preaching of your word. Move in them. Regenerate them. Give them life. Bring them out of their despair, their hopelessness, their futility, their silliness, their banality. Lord, bring them out of their meaningless lives and give them purpose. God, we pray, do a work of salvation, Lord. We want to see it. Please, God, save, God. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.